the main topic that you are addressing, not so good. <laughs> no, <laughs> not that's so, right. Not so positive because you... No, it's, sadly it's not, yeah. You maintain that the monetary and the political system is broken, yeah. hopelessly so. Sadly. And it's only a matter of time before we see the entire collapse of the system and the collapse of fiat. Yeah, so I, I break that, that down for us. Break down how we get to that breakdown. Yeah, sure. I think that's generally right, and it is rather sad, um, but we didn't do it. We didn't, you know, we're not the central banks, and we didn't set up the system. Um, and it, it, it may not be a terrible collapse. It might be a, a reset, which we discussed earlier. But I think what's happened is we've reached kind of peak debt and peak money uh, printing as a solution to our problems. Um, you know, in, in the early days, growing debt and printing money allowed for additional growth, and there was some inflation, but you could get by. And we've now reached that point in time at which the, the supply, the, the growth in the money supply has almost gone vertical. And there's a chart that uh, will be posted with this interview about the M2 chart. And it just shows how, you know, in the, as an example, in the GFC, we printed $3 trillion plus dollars, and it took three or four years to do it. I mean, now we printed $3 trillion plus dollars, and we did it in three months. And, you know, that's, that's an accelerating rate of growth. And, and so I would suggest that because that second derivative is going up so quickly, you know, the next one's going to cost $10 trillion and then larger and larger and larger. And this is how inflations, which could become hyperinflation, get started. And so it's, it's terribly unfortunate. It's going to be very painful, I think, for a lot of people. That's the bad news. There is actually a silver lining here and good news, and that is the system that's broken needs to be reset. And so I think that this will, th these things will drive a reset, and I think a reset will lead to a return to sound money, and I think that will be a better system. So it's not all bad news. <laughs> all right. Well, firstly, when you say sound money, yes. you mentioned that that is the most important contested moral issue of our lifetime. Explain what you I, mean by I, that. I believe it is, and perhaps I'm old fashioned, but um, I think that the world did extremely well on a gold standard throughout the 17, 1800s and, and early 1900s. And we even had a semi gold standard here, although it was at a, at a national level or at the you know, sovereign level until 1971 when Nixon broke it. And you know, sound money allows people to plan um, you know, savings and, and get a return on their capital. Um, unsound money is, is I, I think, a system that allows people uh, who run the system to benefit at the expense of others. It's called the cotillion effect. They get the money first, they borrow cheaply, and, and that additional money, I mean, printing money to pay for things basically is a, is a form of diluting the money stock, and the people who get the money first are able to, to benefit, and everyone else suffers with higher inflation. So it so is a moral is issue. So what is sound money? Is that money backed by gold? Is that the only there, version there, of sound There are several money? forms. There's a competing form now we're going to discuss. But yes, historically, sound money has always been gold because it's the best stock to flow ratio um, uh, asset and it's universally recognized and um, so on and so forth. And so 5,000 years of history says that the best form of sound money is and has been gold and, and probably will continue to some degree to be gold. Uh, there is a competing standard, which everyone's now aware of, and that is that Bitcoin specifically, and I exclude all the other cryptocurrencies, but Bitcoin specifically is a you know, technological form of sound money, which is an immutable ledger, which I believe is as sound or could be ultimately be sounder than gold. It's in the process of being adopted, which has positives and negatives associated with it, but it's come on the scene and become a real contender. And uh, I think could end up being, you know, the winner in a very long time frame. In the shorter time frame, I think they're both going to win. And so um, I've invested in both. So you see a scenario where the monetary system collapses. Mm -hmm. There's a reset, yeah. which results in sound money backed either by gold or Bitcoin or potentially both. I think that's the best case. I mean, it, it could be messy along the way and central banks are going to try CBDCs. And I mean, they're going to try a lot of other stuff, none of which will work. And at the end of the day, you know, it's going to come down to what will people trust? I mean, the reason the money system, we, the monetary system we have works is that people trust it and it has worked, but it's working less and less and less. And when, it, when we get to the point where inflation is just raging, which I believe we are headed there, uh, people are going to say this monetary system does not work. Right. And, uh, well, I mean, look, to, to your point, Larry, mankind has debased fiat currencies throughout the years. I mean, right. there was a time right. when uh, even uh, the Portuguese escuta was the leading currency yes. in the world. Yes, I mean, world there's, there's, this, this is not something new in history, as, although, you know, Keynesians would have you believe that, 
you know, history doesn't matter, but, you know, I mean, Voltaire said it, you know, a couple hundred years ago, you know, all fiat money eventually returns to its intrinsic value, zero. <laughs> Is there anything that the Fed can do at the stage to turn this around? You know, I think it's checkmate. I think they're in a lot of trouble. I mean, let's let's review the history of it, though. I mean, Paul Volcker, and we had the same thing going on in the 70s. Gold had gone from 35 to 80, and Paul Volcker took the interest rates to 20 percent. Okay. I mean, in theory, the way you do it is you create very large, positive, real interest rates, you know, where the, the, the rate of interest on, on your savings is higher than the inflation rate, and you can kill inflation. The question is, is there the political will and the political constellation to allow that to happen? I mean, you know, can you imagine what 20% interest rates would do to the world? I mean, the world, most of the it would world- would be great for my savings. Yeah, well, it would be great for your savings, it would be great for my savings, it would be great for retirees who have saved up capital, which has been getting a 0% interest rate. But it would be terrible. I mean, most of the world would croak. I mean, we would have a depression of, you know, to, to beat the 30s, I think. And so I think the political will to return the money to, to a sounder basis is lacking. Now, you know, maybe they're going to find it. I mean, the one thing I do say is if, if the government were suddenly to say, we're going to get out of all these overseas bases, we're going to cut defense spending, we're going to means test Social Security, we're going to means test Medicare, you know, we're going to cut back on welfare, we're going to get responsible. If, if the U.S. government were to say that, that would not be positive for the sound money camp of which I'm, you know, which I'm a big part of. But, you know, I ask everybody listening to this, what are the odds the government's going to do that in, as it's currently constituted? I mean, we've got Stephanie Kelton advising right. Biden to print more money. So, yeah, there, there are signs. Look, the U.S. empire, sadly, the U.S. empire is leaking. It's like a leaky boat. Now, you know, how, how quick is it going to sink? I don't know. I mean, but it's, it's not it doesn't look great. <laughs> So you think we're at the point of no return then? I really do. I really do. Sadly, I think we are. For people listening to you, well, from watching, an investment point of view, from an investment perspective, happy to answer that. What can an individual do yeah. to protect his or her portfolio? Well, first off, let's let's talk first principles. Bonds are the worst investment in the world right now by a huge measure because they're going to lose their purchasing power. So, it's a very easy call to get rid of all your bonds, in my opinion. Okay. Um, from there, I think you start thinking about what are sound money alternatives. Obviously, some people have chosen housing. It's not crazy. I mean, houses will retain their value. You can live in them. Um, I, you know, I then go to gold and silver coins. I, I specialize in picking gold and silver mining stocks and have done okay with that. And then I think Bitcoin is an emerging form of sound money that's very important as well. And millennials love it. And, and I like it too. I, I'm a very big Bitcoin fan. Um, but I think you, know, you need to move some of your assets into something that provides you with inflation protection. What is your 12-month outlook for <laughs> yeah. both gold and Bitcoin? Don't hold me to this because I'm sure to be wrong, <laughs> as you know. I mean, you just, I mean, projection, you know, making outlooks. But I, look, gold oh. should gold should be ten thousand dollars right now. If you go back and you look at the old monetary, you know, ratios and so forth, gold should easily be ten thousand dollars right now. Um, if you look at Bitcoin, I mean, in my view, Bitcoin could easily be one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars right now. Um, let's let's go to the numbers that we talked about before, because I think it's very meaningful for people to think this through. There's $450 trillion of fiat asset in the world, okay? Not, not real estate. We're talking bonds, stocks, cash, okay? $450 trillion. There's about $7 trillion of tradable gold, and there's more gold than that total, but, you know, the antiquities and the central bank stuff's not tradable, and, and the jewelry I'm considering in India is not tradable. Tradable gold, tradable gold stocks, and Bitcoin is a total of about $7 trillion, okay? $450 of total financial stuff, seven of it in this gold area, right? In 1980, when gold went to 800, gold was 7% of the 450. So that'd be 32 trillion, okay? So seven has got to go to 32, okay? So it's, it's almost a five-bagger, right, on the sound money. And that's if we only go to 1980, and I think we might go beyond 1980. Right. So, so the point I guess I'm trying to make is how, how that breaks out between gold and, and Bitcoin, I don't know. I mean, Bitcoin could win, gold could win. It's unclear. I mean, I'm not smart enough to know. But I, I do know that they both represent a form of sound money, and I do believe they both will win to some okay. degree, right? So I'm going to put you on the spot and <laughs> ask for gold in a year's time. Uh, I think we'll, I think this next run will take us to $2,700 on gold in a okay. year, within a year. Gold in five years time? I think within five years time, it'll be 5,000 minimum, potentially 10,000, potentially infinity. I think, I think this crisis will erupt within six or seven years. I think six or seven okay, years. Okay, so I'll make it easy for you. Gold in 10 years time infinite in dollar terms. It, we won't measure things in dollars. Hmm. There'll, be, there'll, be, there'll, be, there'll be some new dollar or some new currency. Which we'll will measure be, gold and Bitcoin? Uh, maybe, <laughs> possibly. I mean, I, there'll okay. be, you know, the, 
the existing dollar will be dead in 10 years term time in my opinion the existing dollar will be this dead will be in completely 10 years it'll be completely time. worthless in a decade's time in a decade's time look they'll probably try some silly stuff that, that that'll fail too i mean until because what will happen is eventually I mean, once you've lost people's trust on the currency they're going to people are people aren't stupid and they're going to i mean that's why they're buying these houses now right people are going to say hey why should i take this paper i mean I, what, what backs it up you know i mean in, in the big in the bitcoin case it's backed up by a limited size ledger Okay, right. immutable ledger. In the gold case, it's backed up by the fact that you know the supply only grows at 1.7 percent a year, right? So it's, I mean, when 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 it fails, it fails. That's it. It's, it's game over. You know. So a decade till the end of the dollar as we know within, it. Within a, within a decade, this monetary system will have failed. Let's get your outlook on Bitcoin then. 12 month outlook on Bitcoin. <laughs> 12 months, Bitcoin will be north of 150, for sure. And, for sure. All yeah, right. I'm, I, I feel strong about that. And then. Five years on Bitcoin, um, somewhere between a half a million and two million. It'll be very, you know, Bitcoin is is hitting that inflection point in the curve. You know, Malcolm Gradwell's uh, inflection point, mm -hmm. a tipping point. Bitcoin adoption appears to be about 10 percent. And you know, you look at all these other innovations, and there's a chart. You look at all these other innovations and how they get adopted, and, and kind of when they hit that 10 percent level, they tend to accelerate. You know, cell phones, the internet, whatever it might be. And Bitcoin reminds me a lot of the internet. And so when you, when you hit that tipping point, things tend to get going quicker. And I think, I think that's a lot of what's driving Bitcoin, is just the acceptance of it. <laughs>